All right. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, so, so that was Ember. That was four and a half people. What about React? Okay, way more. What about Angular? So five? No. Four? Okay, maybe two. So what, the rest of you, Angular one. Okay, cool. So it's like a good mix, I guess. Um, there are a lot of other frameworks that I came across in my uh, research for this talk. Um, I'll tell a little bit about myself. So I just moved up here from Sydney um, a little over a month ago. Um, I work for a company called um, GBST, um, and they have a subsidiary called Enu, which is a design agency. And James over here, um, he's my boss, and he's the head of digital for GBST. So um, hit us up later after the talk um, if you like it. So some of our clients um, around the world, um, so I'm only doing this because it gives me a little bit of credibility, because I don't know anybody. So you know, I'm, I'm working with a company that has clients like ANZ, EV Games, and Rebel, like we do their entire uh, e-commerce um, stuff. So yeah, there are a lot more that I'm not allowed to show. Um, okay, so disclaimer, all views are my own, uh, not endorsed by my employer or anybody else, maybe the community or some comments somewhere. Uh, the Stack Overflow page. Um, I am not going to upsell Ember or downgrade any other framework. Um, so I graduated about a year and a half ago, and it so happens that I started working, um, and Ember was um, the flavor of the company um, back in Sydney, and I got into it. So I've been doing Ember for about 18 months now, and that's what I'm doing um, here in Brisbane. Um, I did use Ionic at one point in that, you know, I got an experience with Angular 1 and all, uh, but now it's Ember. Um, so no JavaScript frameworks were created during the making of this presentation, just my dad. <laughs> Alright, so um, there's this really nice um, article on Hacker Noon called How It Feels to Learn JavaScript in 2016. How many of you have gone through that one? Okay, so a couple of you. So maybe about 50%. So um, I've taken an excerpt out of that, because when, when I read this, I actually had tears in my eyes, because I resonated with this so much, because there's a multitude of things available, and you know, I, if you ask me to make a website, I'd open um, a file, um, you know, text editor and go .html at the end of it, and you know, try to go from there. But, um, sorry, technical difficulties again. <laughs> Let me forgive you, Ash. I should come back. I got it here. Oh, cool. Thanks. graduate who was trying to you know get some data from point A to point B and this, this is the conversation between two people and the, the junior dev as you may was absolutely confused by the end of it and I felt like that in every conversation I have so um, so basically so the guy goes I'm not gonna go through the entire thing but I'll, I'll go through a few of these things so goes, hey I got this new web project but to be honest I haven't coded much uh, web in a few years, and I've heard the landscapes change a bit. You're the most up-to-date web dev around here, right? The actual term is front-end engineer, but yeah, I'm the right guy. I do web in 2016. Visualization, music players, flying drones that play football, you name it. I just came back from JSCon and ReactCon, so I'm the authority on everything web. So, this guy goes like, so I just need to create a, a page that displays the latest activity from the users. So I just need to get the data from the REST endpoint and display it in some sort of filterable table and update it if anything changes in the server. I was thinking maybe using jQuery to fetch and display the data. 
And he's like, oh my god, no, nobody uses jQuery anymore. You should try learning React. It's 2016. Oh, OK. What's React? It's a super cool library made by some guys at Facebook. It uh, brings control and performance to your application by allowing you to handle view changes very easily. So that sounds neat. Can I use React to display data from the server? Yeah, but you need to have React and React Dom as a library in your web page. Wait, why two libraries? So one is actually one is the actual library, and the second one is for manipulating the DOM, which you can now do in describing JSX. JSX. What what is JSX? Well, it's pretty much like JavaScript. Um, it's a syntax extension that looks pretty much like XML. Um, it's kind of another way to describe the DOM. Think of it as better HTML. But what's wrong with HTML? <laughs> it's 2016. No one codes HTML directly anymore. So if I add these two libraries, I can use React? Not quite. You need to add Babel. And then you're able to use React. What's Babel? Oh, it's a transpiler that allows you to target specific blah, 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 and something like ES5 and ES2016 plus, and you know, cool kids later that same thing. <laughs> Look, I'm just loading a bunch of data from the server. I used to be able to just include jQuery from a CDN and just get the data with AJAX calls. Why can't I just do that? It's 2016 and no one uses jQuery anymore. It ends up in a bunch of spaghetti code. Everyone knows that. Um, include those three libraries, but bundle them up with the module manager to load only one file. I see. And what's the module manager? Oh, there are ways to describe multiple JavaScript libraries and classes you shouldn't track. You know, exports and requires you should use something like Browserify to bundle them up with Browserify. So this keeps going on and on and on and on and on. And on, and on. And one eternity later, the junior dev goes, so you're saying ES6 native template strings for the view, uh, which requires Babel, which I need to load as a module from NPM, which requires Browserify, Webpack, or that thing called uh, System.js, which, unless it's Webpack, should be managed by a task runner. But since I should be using functional programming and type languages, I first need to pre-compile TypeScript or add this flow thing and send to Babel if I want to use a wait. So I can then use fetch promises and control flow and all that magic. I'll just use just move to back end. <laughs> I heard you, then you should try the Python community then. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, Python sounds good. Ever heard of Python 3? So you know it just goes around in a in a circle, and um, there's always this new stuff um, coming up. So, you know, if we move on from here, the next logical question is, do I need a framework? And as the most um, common of all answers, the answer is, it depends. So, you know, it depends on the skills of your team. It depends on what your business is doing. It depends on whether your lead developer leaves and somebody else is able to fill his shoes. Um, sometimes uh, companies go, oh, we want vanilla JS. We, we, um, don't, want, uh, we don't want any frameworks. Um, and more often than not, um, sometimes they, find out, they, f they end up finding themselves creating a homegrown framework, which they must then maintain. And when the next talent comes along, then that gets rewritten or that gets changed. It's a constant, um, there's no end to it. So um, I came across this, um, this particular article on SitePen, um, and the motivation for that article was, well, we saw um, what it feels like to code in JavaScript in 2016. Well, is there something out there for 2017? So this um, article, this is up to date as of third week of November this year. So they compared Angular, React with um, Redux, uh, Vue.js, um, Dojo, Two, Ember, and Aurelia. And um, so this, this is another disclaimer. This site pen did not have 
a particular liking towards Ember or they were not biased towards Ember or against it, they very fairly you know, evaluated um, all of these frameworks. And um, they evaluated these frameworks against um, five, six, seven, um, eight uh, metrics, so user interface development, which includes you know, your, your UI tools, your components, your elements, what have you. User experience design is your, well, is there any, uh, like with Ionic, you have a set of components that you use, you have material design with Angular, so is there any particular um, flow of um, you know, user experience throughout the framework? Foundational technologies include, so what are they sort of based on, um, is it future proof, is it conforming to the modern standards? Um, the enhancements that it has going forward, what about like internationalization, localization, stuff like that. The applications um, that you build with these frameworks, um, so we'll go into all of these in, in relatively small detail later on. Common usage, so whether it's a banking app, whether it's a, a, um, a consumer app, it's a mobile app, it's an enterprise app, um, then using and developing, so for our community here, how easy it is to use and develop other command line tools, um, testing and the community behind it. So what they said about Ember in their um, sort of conclusion was that it's probably the most mature framework out of all of them available there, and Ember has been around for quite a long time. Um, there is not a lot of um, um, support behind Ember, and one of the reasons is that it's a, it's a very opinionated mainstream framework. That is why it's somewhat popular with Rails developers, because Rails is also quite opinionated. It's a whole convention over configuration. Um, Ember does have comprehensive version management, so they do let you know um, what's coming up, what's being deprecated, um, well in advance before it actually takes those standards. Um, it aligns to modern standards, so it does have um, it does have ES6, and um, it, it's sort of adding this new um, templating engine called Glimmer, which is based on TypeScript. Um, it does not abandon legacy browsers prematurely. The major contributors, Yahuda Katz and Tom Dale, are part of the TC39 um, committee, so it really so Ember has a lot of say in there, and vice versa. So whatever is happening in there. It reflects in Ember. Um, so yeah, Glimmer is writing a new UI framework, and Ember is good for large teams because it has a very strong model view controller um, setup, and you can have separation of concerns, separation of work. This is something that I've experienced um, as well. So um, they said, if you want to place confidence in an organization to stay current and think critically about changes to their platform, then Ember.js would be a good consideration. You can spend less time worrying about keeping current with technology trends and focus more on creating um, applications. So if we go into, um, quickly go into what Ember has to offer across these verticals, then starting with UI, so Ember has um, its um, um, UI elements as components. Um, it uses handlebars to do its templating. Um, it aligns to web components. So web components is this um, sort of, I think it's a document saying, you know, this is what web components should look like on modern browsers, and Ember is already there trying to um, conform to those standards. It does not have out-of-the-box components. It has something called Ember add-on, which are like a lot of libraries that, that one can um, uh, include in their Ember apps, and the libraries include everything from components to authentication to offline usage. So it has a very strong community around building those add-ons um, and maintaining them. Um, Ember has reusable comp components using Ember's command line interface, which is really, really good. Um, it is a well-integrated tool chain, and it uses Broccoli as a build tool. Uh, that's built into Ember's CLI. Okay, so um, with the UX. So Ember being a very opinionated framework is actually unopinionated when it comes to um, its uh, the way to manage the look. Ember is focused more on the application, so the theming and styling are left entirely up to the developer. 
uh, there are component CSS um, style sheets are not built into the framework. You can add classes in the templating library um, with handlebars and just go from there. And um, so Ember, um, I think 3.0 has Ember support, which is written in TypeScript and uses ES6. So um, foundation technology, supported environments for Ember are IE 9 to 11, pretty standard Firefox, Chrome, Edge, Safari, iOS, Android. It does have a fast boot, um, which, is, which helps with server-side rendering. So you can process uh, some of the calculations before sending the assets to the client side in case you're working with constraints um, on the client side with performance. Um, it supports Node.js um, 4+. Um, modern standards, um, it has it has ES5, but it, it, you can um, use ES6+, plus and you can transpile to ES5 using Babel. Um, enhancements, so going forward, Ember is going to strip down um, using jQuery, which they have let the community know well in advance. Um, Babel, Babel uses standard poly rules as part of the uh, build process, and I18 and L10 and use um, Yahoo's implementation of format just as an add-on. Uh, forward compatibility. So the upgrade path from Angular 1 to Angular 2 was one of the biggest reasons that a lot of companies um, stopped using it, and I got horribly confused when I tried to look at my Angular code in a bit or two um, back at uni. But with uh, Ember, they had a very clear path from 1.13 uh, to 2, and similarly uh, for 3.0 as well. Um, for example, like recently they stripped down um, their imports from importing the entire Ember library into making it more modular. So if you want the router, you just import the router or just the controller um, and so on. Um, with application de uh, development, here it gets a little bit interesting here. Um, you do have state management, data integration, and persistence, service integration, and offline capabilities. So if we look at how Ember fares um, in these categories, um, so state management can actually mean different things to different people, um, but uh, with Ember as um, Ember as a router-driven control, so whenever you um, as user interacts, the state changes, and the controller is what's responsible for it. It um, it retrieves the data from the model and um, sends it um, to the template. And which manages the state. Um, it has an Ember application, which is sort of like the overarching thing for the entire application, which is the sort of source of truth for the Ember application. It's accessible across all models and controllers, and um, it does have. Um, so we yeah, with data integration and persistence, Ember data is um, thing that is bundled with Ember and that standardizes JSON API. It is fairly easy to integrate with backend data and services. Um, it's JSON API is actually a set of conventions to create RESTful services without the need to debate the implementation details. Ember data adheres to these conventions. Um, with service integration, um, it has a framework for creating services, um, and those um, can sort of um, have internal work management, and it can also manage async um, workflow. The Ember bundle um, does these things. Um, and offline capabilities, it doesn't have any out of the box, but there are add-ons available that can do that. So for um, common usages, uh, so you have mobile apps, consumer apps, or business apps. Um, you do have progressive web apps. So these are screenshots that it took um, from some of the um, articles that I found comparing different things. So it's not biased towards Ember, it's just relating the details. Uh, it does have progressive web app support. Um, progressive web apps is a set of best practices leveraging standards available on browsers and mobiles. Uh, we spoke about server-side rendering where you can, um, you can uh, render some of the stuff on the server side and it's intended to be fine. Um, we already spoke about the mobile components in UX and Cordova support, there's nothing direct. So, um, mobile apps it has three out of four crosses, just one tick. But when we move on to consumer applications, um, you see that 
that it's a slightly better uh, perspective with Ember. Um, this basically means that there is support coming up for this in the future um, releases, and we are fairly certain that it will be there. And A11Y is basically accessibility. Um, so if you're developing a solution like a banking website or the or any other sort of app that does not require the user to be set in a particular user journey, it's not you can make changes um, without disturbing the user's um, uh, journey through the through the app. Um, Ember fares uh, well with single page application routing. That's it's an SPA app authentication. Um, there are plenty of third party implementation that we use as well. Data validation, so the controllers are responsible for validating the data that comes back from the template. Um, server integration, server interaction, defaults provided, and additional adapters available. So um, Ember uses a JCO, JSON API adapter to um, read and send all data from the from the back end, um, and accessibility is coming up, and it's fairly certain to do that. Ember actually has um, a testing suite of uh, uh, which tests your app against a bunch of accessibility tests. So that's um, a slide win for Ember. With business applications, um, internationalization, localization, and by business applications, I mean things where the user journey is fairly set. There's not a lot of scope of changing, um, and ch any changes have a huge process involved with it. So, you know, which we will pass as well. Um, using and developing. So um, Ember has um, typical workflow, workflow and roles. Um, it has separation of concerns. So if I'm working on the router, then somebody else can be working on the components and they, there will not be any problem. It's very separate. It's great for large teams. Um, with tooling, um, Ember has a feature rich and extensible CLI. Um, with build and deployment, Ember JS Build has a ton of documentation available to it. So it's all built in with the um, Ember CLI. We don't have to um, go ahead and, and install a bunch of different uh, node modules. Um, what Ember ships with, you can basically build and deploy something with it. Um, with debugging, Ember has a Chrome extension called Ember Inspector which helps you visualize what's happening at runtime. A lot of other modern frameworks have that these days as well. Um, with testing, Ember emphasizes using QUnit, um, Travis CI for, for continuous integration, code climate for um, code quality, and Phantom JS until recently headless Chrome um, when it came out. And we, all, uh, we went through the accessibility, provide a set of um, accessibility tests, and performance testing, it's not built into QUnit, it's through the Ember inspector. Um, with community, um, spearheaded by Yuda Katz and Tom Dale, they're part of the TC39 committee. Um, it's got a strong community behind it. Um, it's MIT license. The license was a bit of an issue with uh, React recently, but um, Ember has been MIT from the beginning. Um, a bunch of open source contributions, um, good Stack Overflow community. and. Um, Look at has its tilde.io. He provides a bunch of training through that. So, um, for the business, for uh, GBST and for um, EMU design, uh, this is um, a screen grab uh, from a document which um, they were working on deciding <coughs> um, um, extensible JS, Angular, React with Flux, and Ember. And, um, so this was actually put into use, and that is the reason why today we're using Ember as a company. Um, Ember won by a slight bit over React. Um, I think the biggest changes for Ember over React was um, the long-term viability and um, large apps bit. So at that time, it, Ember was sort of being compared to React and Flux two years ago. Um, so Ember had that slight win. Um, back then. So um, to generate more interest in Ember in the Brisbane um, community, uh, GBST um, has decided to start an Ember.js meetup 
Um, and we were to have our first one last week, but that got canceled and we decided to go ahead with having an Ember.js meetup in um, the new year, so probably in January. Uh, that's our Ember.js um, community page, and James is the organizer and the co-organizer for that. Um, our office is located just um, on top of Ann Street, and it's um, about a five minute walk from Central Station, so on the other side of um, Ann Street. Um, that's it for me. Um, do we have any questions? It was a bit rushed, but there was a lot to cover. But um, over the next um, Ember meetups, we want to go through these things in detail. Okay, so I have a question. I've heard of Glimmer before. Yeah. I don't really know what it does. Can you explain what, what this is? So Glimmer is, um, um, and if anybody wants to join in, because I'm not an expert on this, please feel free. Um, from what I've seen, Glimmer is a um, templating um, alternative to handlebars for Ember. It has um, classes uh, available. It uses TypeScript. It uses the ES2016 um, plus syntax. Um, I think the biggest benefit of Glimmer was that it improves rendering speeds by a lot for Ember. And um, that was one of the complaints that a lot of people had with Ember, that the rendering speeds are a bit slow. So they swapped out handlebars for Glimmer, um, saying, you know, it makes it quite fast. Um, yeah, does that answer me? Just to add on to that, the difference between handlebars and Glimmer is that Glimmer uses a virtual DOM no. to render it out, hence it's a speed update from that. It, it, it does more than that. It's also got a virtual on CSS. Um, so it is hard to speak things up very, very well. Yeah. Any other questions? It's, it's glamorous. Um, Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.